Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. Isaiah chapter 12 and verses four and five read, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Tim Sturby comes to sing praise to the Lord. King of creation, O oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near, praise him in glad adoration. Praise to the so wondrously reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires there have been? Granted in what he in the adore him all that hath life and breath come now with praises before him let the amen sound from his people again gladly for a we adore him oh, The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions and we search the scriptures in order to find the answers from God's word. Question number one, after receiving Jesus Christ, am I to think of myself as a sinner or a saint? Perhaps you have heard the song, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That is exactly true, but it does not answer the question, are we to regard ourselves yet while on this earth as a sinner or are we rightly to obtain and to take to ourselves what seems to be the lofty title of saint or holy one? Go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 7. The Apostle Paul, as he is beginning this unique letter of his to a church that he had not visited as of yet, he says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has no hesitation to refer to these people in Rome, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as saints. If you go also to Philippians and the first verse, and Colossians, the second verse, you find that Paul says to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, and then he also says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. So three times, Rome, Philippi, Colossae, and I'm sure he would have done exactly the same to others, he calls them as saints. I think that if we do not use this title, though use it carefully, we devalue and we depreciate the work of Calvary's cross and what Jesus did there. Was it indeed finished as Jesus said it was, the work of salvation? Indeed it was. Now, yet we, as Paul himself speaks in Romans about how that he struggled with sin and how that we will yet struggle with sin, yet the work is done, the victory is assured in Jesus Christ, 
And we rightly refer to ourselves and we rightly refer to brothers and sisters in Christ as saints of God, as holy ones. That comes about by faith, not by our efforts, our works to clean ourselves up. Paul, in chapter 1, he says in verse 17, the just, the righteous man shall live by faith. And that is our confidence. Question number two, when believers are judged by God, are we judged for what we did before and after we became a believer, a Christian? We go now to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, and here we are told that, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they're as bad as they could be. They will be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson. They will be like wool. Then also Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, it says, I, even I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, the Lord declares, and I will not remember your sins. Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, actually verses 18 and 19, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? And verse 19, yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And God says, no fishing allowed. But perhaps above all, I go once again, as I so frequently do, to 1 John chapter 1, and verse 9, which says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, you might say, all right, that's before I became a believer in Christ, that Christ has dealt with my sins and they are gone, fully gone, praise the Lord, gone. Keep reading. That indeed does deal with prior to coming to Christ. And then, as we struggle with sin, and as sometimes it gets the best of us in this world, you read in chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2, I am writing these things so that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Your sins before salvation, your sins following salvation, you bring those to the cross of Christ, you bring them to the mercy seat, and those are blotted out. And so, believer, you will not be judged for those sins against you. You will be judged, and God will allot to us rewards for what we have done in his name, in terms of bringing others to salvation, encouraging one another, serving him faithfully in those various ways. But as far as judgment, I think that the, the questioner is really asking about the judgment for our sins. Those things are blotted out, and these verses which I have given to you, they are rich encouragement, and there are others as well. They are rich encouragement, and I encourage you to meditate and to ponder on them and to just hold them tightly to your heart whenever the devil comes and he would want to poke at you and he would want to torment you about what he would want you to believe is coming ahead. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us and we will use it as quickly as we are able. Our mailing address, Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Heidi Taves now sings, Shall We Gather at the River? And that is followed by the male quartet singing, Room at the Cross for You. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod?
shining I've been talking to you about this book by my father, Dr. H. H. Barber. It contains 28 sermons of his from Old Testament and New Testament. They are brief biographical sketches of biblical characters, men and women. We would like to give you this copy, free and postage paid. It's entitled, A Cloud of Witnesses. I have also taken the liberty on the passing of my father to include one more biographical sketch, and that is of Dad. Each of the biographical sketches which he included are four pages. There were four blank pages in the back, and I have written a, a tribute in honor of Dad's life. This is for you, and I know you will enjoy going through the pages with Dad. And also on the back cover, there is several pictures of Dad's life over different periods of time. Ask for a cloud of witnesses. It will be sent as all of our resources are free and postage paid to you. Our mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Or you may use our toll-free phone number 1833. 
for FTLB, 1-833-367-3852, or our website, faithtoliveby.ca. Rick Bowring now comes to sing what is undoubtedly my mom's favorite song, The Lord Is My Light. shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Though a host of men were laid against me, Yet shall not my heart be afraid, and though there rose a war against me, yet will I put my trust in Him. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his tabernacle. Yea, in the secret places of his dwelling shall he hide me. And set me up upon a rock of stone. The Lord is my light and my sight. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Of whom then shall I be Afraid. We continue in our studies out of Isaiah, the great prophet of the Old Testament major prophets. And we come to Isaiah chapter 11. I think that you will find these familiar words. Sometimes, often we hear them at Christmas time, but they are so applicable at any point of the year as they exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and the great work that he has done because of the greatness of his very person. We read, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. That was Jesus' great ancestor, the father of King David. A shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. It's incredible how that 
over 700 years prior to Jesus coming, Isaiah would see with crystal clarity, both here and elsewhere, of the person of Jesus Christ and of his splendor. And why not? The Spirit of the Lord was stirring within Isaiah. And even as in chapter 6, Isaiah had seen the Lord high and exalted, the same Lord who had opened Isaiah's eyes in a time of turbulence in the nation when their king, Uzziah, was laid low in death. Yet Isaiah's eyes were lifted to see great and glorious things. And Isaiah would not simply see throne room of heaven open before him, but he would in time see the future open before him, and he would see Jesus who would come 700 plus years later to be born in Bethlehem. He would see this one born of a virgin whose character would be such as what we have read right here. Jesus, he would come from the royal line of King David. He would be the greatest offspring of Jesse. Jesse had numerous sons, you will remember, when Samuel went to anoint a new king in place of King Saul, who had turned away from the Lord. And the Lord was saying, no longer shall Saul be my appointed one, but I will seek out a king after mine own heart. Saul went obediently to the little town of Bethlehem. And there he was directed to the house of Jesse. And Jesse's sons, one after another, were brought before him. But the Spirit of the Lord said to Samuel, No, not this one, or this one, or this one. And he will, goes through all of them. And Samuel says to Jesse, Are these all of your sons? And Jesse says, Well, they're still the youngest. Uh, you, you would read that essentially as the runt of the bunch. He's out tending the sheep. We didn't even think of asking him to come. And Samuel says, we will not sit down to eat until he comes in. David does come in. And immediately the spirit of the Lord stirs within Samuel's heart. And he says, anoint him. He is the one. But David as great as he was. There were flaws in his life. There were problems through the years. But yet, God had declared to David that he would never lack a man to sit upon his throne. God kept his word, not simply in a human line, but God kept his word to David in that his own descendant would be the Messiah and would reign for all eternity, King of kings and Lord of lords. And see how that the Spirit would not only stir in Old Testament prophets, but the Spirit of the Lord would so stir within Jesus' divine heart. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. It will abide there. It will tabernacle, as it were. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom. Solomon was well known for his wisdom, but a greater than Solomon stood before the people there in Galilee and when Jesus went through Samaria and into Judea or wherever he went. He was the greater one, infinitely wise in all things. The spirit of wisdom and understanding was resting upon him. The spirit of counsel and strength. People came to Jesus with their toughest questions and they received an answer. Those who came to Jesus and they thought that they could stump him. They thought that they had him tied up in a corner where he couldn't get out. Jesus, he through the counsel, the spirit of counsel that was dwelling within and the strength, he was able to undo. And those who thought they were the captors became the captives in their own web. We read here, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Jesus was ever reverential to his heavenly father, doing his holy bidding. He, Jesus, 
he would come and delight in the fear of the Lord. He didn't judge by what his eyes saw, but he made decisions in righteousness for all who came to him, never despising the meek and the lowly, those who were high and puffed up, who couldn't think high enough about themselves. Jesus would help them to a serving of humble pie at times. But here, Jesus, he was the one who would do these great things. And looking forward, he is the one who will slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. So great, so mighty. And the scripture reads that we are to come to him. We are to lay our need before him. We are to place our hope and our trust in him. And this is the mighty savior that Isaiah declares. He from the other side in time from us of Jesus Christ, we on this side, we have received so much revelation and understanding. Oh, that people would grab a hold of it and that they would live in Jesus' name. Have you come to Jesus Christ? Have you come to the one in whom such wisdom and understanding and knowledge dwells, and the one who reaches out to you? Oh, how he loves you. How he would want to save you from your sins. How he would want you to know God's forgiveness for you. Come to the cross. There is room at the cross for you, but humble yourself and come and know his salvation and know it today. Thank you for joining Pastor Barber today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 